So um, thanks for the invite and thanks for the for, for the introduction. I um, great honor to be here. I uh, heard about this this series for a long time and watched some of the videos too. Um, given the occasion to those of you who um, uh, who are not in, in in the consciousness space, I mean, this will be a somewhat slightly indulgent talk. Uh, usually, I, I usually give talks and we just go through, as a scientist, we go through our data and talk about recent studies. Of course, in the pandemics, there has not been a lot of data. And another reason is I also want to take this occasion to talk a bit about something I don't usually talk about as much, which is theories of consciousness. So the reason I don't talk so much so often about theories of consciousness is actually, it may surprise you uh, if I say that, but but actually, it is one of my least favorite topic to talk about. Uh, in fact, I think I think quite often uh, uh, discussion in this area is quite disappointing and, and confusing. And the reason is, um, I think you can you can think of most of your favorite theories of consciousness as having this problem. And I think many of us know that it is a bit of a problem. Usually, when we think of consciousness uh, or of theoretical studies of consciousness, quite often the theory takes the form that they will say, well, consciousness is X, where X might be a, a global broadcast or a predictive coding or, or integrated information or anything. I mean, it's really a generic argument. Uh, they say that consciousness is X. And sometimes what we really mean is just that, well, introspectively, things look like eggs and, and we are conscious, right? So, so uh, um, this is maybe a good starting point. And I think that that makes some sense. And, and introspectively, consciousness does look quite global and predictive and resonant and deep and uh, reflexive and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they, they do seem to be not so bad, but if you apply it to um, um, other problems, then you'll see that the logic of it breaks down pretty easily. So imagine if you're Martians coming to planet Earth and, and try to work out what these um, um, boxes that, that human beings use to store food, and you open them, you see the light inside, and you see that, well, the food is cold. This is amazing. So they have a technology that uh, allows them to, to chill the food. And, and, and you might ask, oh, so what, what is this light doing? Why, why, why there's a light inside the fridge and there's no light you know, elsewhere like this? And you might think, oh, this is maybe the reason because the, the, the light of the fridge actually chills the food. So when it shines on the food, it makes the temperature goes down. Um, and of course, this is a silly example. And uh, that would be some not very clever kind of Martians who would come to this conclusion. And you might think, what is the problem? Well, the problem, of course, is for the Martians to, to, to not make these uh, logical errors. They have to think about what happens when the lights goes out, right? So they might just look at the fridge and say, the, the light is on. Uh, when they close the fridge, they assume that the light might continue to go on. And then they look elsewhere, there's no, not, not the same light. And then they draw this conclusion, which is not silly. But in order to not to go into this uh, logical problem, they should learn how to turn off the light and see what's going on, right? And in consciousness study, I think uh, decades of work have somewhat convinced people like me that we don't do this often enough. Uh, we don't really ask ourselves what happens when a process is non-conscious. Does this X still apply? So in other words, I'm saying, are, are you sure that there's no, not a single instance when you're not conscious or when the process is not conscious and yet you fail to have global broadcasts integrated information, predictive coding, or whatever X, you name it. And I think if you review the literature carefully, the answer is yes, there are actually those counterexamples quite easily found. But we tend to brush it under the rug. And you might think, well, this is not as bad because we are very careful experimental scientists, right? We don't just do introspection. Uh, of, even though the theory starts of introspection, we can do experiments. So the experiment could be something like this. You try to turn off the fridge light. You try to hit a certain brain mechanism so that you uh, switch off consciousness. And then after consciousness is switched off, you will say, well, now X is gone. Uh, so let's say global broadcast is gone uh, when, you, when you render someone unconscious by giving them uh, uh, general anesthesia. Uh, then you say, well, now X is gone. So clearly X is necessary for consciousness. Uh, I highlight the word necessary in red because it's clearly wrong. Uh, you, can, you can think why, right? Because the, the Martian can likewise say, well, now we, we figure out a way to uh, turn off the, the fridge 
which is to unplug the fridge, uh, uh, turn off the light, the light in the, in the in the in the fridge by unplugging the fridge, or you wait for electric outage or something. Then you say, well, clearly now that the the light of the fridge is off and the food isn't cold anymore, the, the ice cream start melting and stuff. So they might likewise conclude that uh, the fridge light is necessary for chilling the food. And obviously that is wrong. And if you want to think about what is the problem is should be obvious, it's really about how you hit this mechanism, right? If you hit this mechanism in a pretty general way, like you unplug the fridge or you apply general anesthesia to people, then obviously you knock out a whole bunch of stuff and then that X might be gone just because X is just normally how the brain works. And, and if you knock it out, so there's no more global broadcast, no more predictive coding, et cetera, it will be wrong for you to, to conclude that this is actually the direct mechanism for consciousness. Um, so this is a pretty bad problem. And I think we, we all know that this is a problem. Uh, and the solution should be clear is that we should look for a, a more specific way to turn off consciousness, such as by actually really turning off the light switch without turning off the whole fridge. Uh, but this is not so easy. So I promise that this will be, um, or, or maybe not promise, I warn you that this will be a somewhat indulgent talk. I'm, a, I'm an experimental scientist, but I'm gonna just give you this one example of, of a study that may come across as being quite different from what I'm talking about, but it would become clear why this is actually very relevant. Essentially, I'm going to explain a method with which you can um, quite specifically manipulate consciousness. And it's quite interesting. So this is done by a former postdoc of mine, who's uh, now an independent faculty at University of Montreal, uh, Vincent Testereau de Monchel. So he um, um, presented a lot of images to people, uh, uh, many, many of them from many different categories of animals and objects. And he uh, put them in fMRI scanner while doing that. So he recorded uh, from, from people's brain the uh, voxel or the patterns of uh, brain activity from the ventral temporal areas, where then you can use um, um, multivoxel pattern analysis or some sort of very basic uh, machine learning methods to read out these patterns and then predict what people are seeing or representing in the brain. So these are all pretty standard these days in, in, uh, in cognitive science, in cognitive neuroscience. And so he managed to do that. And then uh, for each subject, he then picked two of these categories based on people's subjective reports of what they're afraid of. So for a typical subject, they might say, well, I'm afraid of several of these things that you've shown me, such as a spider uh, or a snake, including both of these. And then you say, okay, so these are the two things that you're really most afraid of from, the, from that category. And then we randomize and pick one as a target and one as a control. And we randomize it in a double-blinded fashion. That is, we don't know which is which. Uh, we just let the computer flip a coin and, and the experimenter doesn't know, the subject doesn't know. And then we chose one as the target. And the reason we chose it as a target is, um, is that we put them in the fMRI scanner again. And then whenever the brain uh, spontaneously show these patterns of activity that resembles the representation uh, of this target, that is if the brain pattern looks like that it is seeing or thinking about a spider, we then uh, give them a bit of money. Uh, we actually gave them money, but not in the scanner. We gave them a, a signal that they would get some money, sometimes in the, in the fraction of a dollar, uh, or, or in, it was done in Japan, actually. So it would be something like 10 yen or 20 yen, et cetera. Um, so over time, you might think what will happen. Well, obviously, uh, this becomes a kind of pair associative learning, uh, like, like Pavlov's dog. So over time, you would learn that uh, this, this, this representation of, um, uh, of spider actually is paired with something very nice, like, like money, uh, which people tend to like. And then obviously, the, the hypothesis is then they would start to like the spider. So in, in learning, in animal learning literature, sometimes we call this counter conditioning. That is, instead of starting from a very negative, aversive reaction to the spider, hopefully by repairing that with something else, with something positive, we can make them like spider better. Uh, so they would become less afraid of spiders. And now, why do we want to do this very complicated thing? Why don't we just give them a spider uh, and give them money? The reason is, if you do it through the brain this way, it is actually entirely non-conscious. The reason being that your spontaneous occurrence of your brain voxel pattern activities is mostly non-conscious. Because one thing we've learned in, in cognitive neuroscience in the past two decades is that spontaneous activity is very, very uh, 
common, is ubiquitous. Uh, in fact, most of your brain's energy budget is spent on these spontaneous activity. And yet, of course, you are not conscious of most of them, right? I mean, you, you, basically, if you use fMRI to measure, despite the activity in your brain would go up and down in, in a cycle of about 10 seconds per, cy uh, per cycle. So every 10 seconds or so, your brain will look as if it is thinking about a spider. Um, but obviously, you don't think about spider every 10 seconds. So, uh, and you don't hallucinate seeing them every 10 seconds. So all of this is happens non-consciously. So basically, we are taking the occurrence, the non-conscious occurrence of spider representations in your brain and try to do associative learning with them. Now, lo and behold, it's a long story, but to cut to the chase, the, the, the story was basically it worked and it worked almost amazingly well. This is a uh, amygdala activity, uh, a brain activity, a brain region that sometimes is linked to fear, but I think it's more correctly, it should be linked to threat. I'll, I'll explain in a minute why uh, there's a difference, but this is a, an, an area that would show uh, heightened activity when you show people something fat, uh, threatening. So, um, so before the procedure, uh, the procedure lasts for a few hours, by the way. We, we, we pair them with money over hundreds of, of, of repetitions done over a few hours, spread, spread over a few days. So after a few hours of this training, uh, you see that uh, uh, the before and after look very different. And this bar here reflects the fact that when you show them a spider, uh, a picture of a spider, amygdala activity actually shoots up. But actually after the procedure, you will see that basically this is completely flattened to almost like mildly negative. And this is specific to the target, but not the control. So the control is these bars over there. And for the, so this is not a generic passage of time effect, not that they've been in the scanner for so long, they are just desensitized and, and not caring about what you show them anymore. For the control, which is subjectively indistinguishable from the target because the whole procedure is, is computerized and non-conscious, uh, it, it doesn't have the same effect. So the, for the control animal, uh, the whatever, uh, scary animal that didn't get selected. It actually trigger uh, as much brain activity uh, in the amygdala. So we almost like selectively we, we dampened the uh, threat related response in the, in the amygdala. And you can show this in uh, skin conductance as well, because when you're scared, uh, essentially you, you physiologically you sweat a little and so your skin conductance goes up. So your skin conductance can be used as a measure of how uh, physiologically uh, 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 freak out you are, I uh, like uh, about two, towards a certain stimuli. And it's the same basically pattern, uh, same basic pattern. So your target, uh, when you see the target animal, basically your physiological arousal went flat after this procedure. So that's pretty cool. So we can actually non-consciously make people less afraid of spiders or snakes or whatever they, they happen to be afraid of. Some of you might be skeptical. This look almost too good to be true. Uh, I am cherry picking a little bit. I can confess this is one of the strongest demo uh, demonstration I've seen for this kind of technique. But actually this is a replication of a previous paper uh, conceptually where we do something very similar, but for a uh, different kind of stimuli. It's not naturally occurring fear towards animals. It's just some more abstract uh, stimuli. But basically we know now that we can reduce uh, threat, physiological threat response. Um, I emphasize this threat response because uh, the subjective ratings of fear didn't actually change. So if you ask people before and after uh, to rate these animals how afraid you are, they would just say, well, I'm still afraid of snakes. Uh, but the physiological excessive arousal is gone, but the subjective self-reported uh, fear is just the same. So that might be a bit of a, a downer. That might be a bit of a, a disappointment. So it doesn't change the subjective fear. Um, what good is that? So according to uh, my colleagues like Joe Ladue, they would say, well, this is exactly what is predicted because you use a non-conscious method to try to uh, modulate threat response. It shouldn't change fear. To change fear, you need to consciously engage the subject. We are now testing it. Uh, and in fact, we are now testing it in the context of a clinical trial. I'm running a clinical trial uh, funded by the NIH in the US uh, with my colleagues, at, uh, with my former colleagues at, the, uh, at UCLA. And you might think, what good is a clinical trial, given that you, you already told me uh, you couldn't change their subjective level of fear. The reason that it, uh, it is quite interesting to, um, to do a clinical trial still is because 
uh, we know that the common treatments of, um, of this kind of um, phobia, let's say we're, we're actually taking phobic patients, uh, usually they would just go for exposure therapy in the clinic. So basically the procedure involved them to gradually think about a, a spider to the point that they can imagine spiders and then they can actually look at a spider from a distance. Eventually they can just play with spiders. Uh, so the procedure works, uh, it works pretty well, but the problem is of course, people don't, don't like doing that. Uh, they tend to just drop out from these studies uh, prematurely. Uh, they quite often do. In the case of let's say PTSD, when you want people to uh, overcome the the trauma, you want them to relive the experience, they want, you want them to talk about it, imagine it, and maybe reenact it and relive the experience. And usually it's very painful for the, for the patients and quite often they just, they just drop out prematurely. So our logic here is if we can uh, use a completely non-conscious method to reduce the physiological excessive arousal, then maybe they will find it easier to tolerate going through the normal treatment. So we are not trying to replace the normal treatment, but trying to uh, complement it. And the other reason is if we're directly working in the brain like this, uh, we might also uh, have a higher chance of avoiding relapse. The reason uh, is that these treatments actually work pretty well, but quite often uh, people uh, would relapse. So after learning that, okay, in this experimental room, with this uh, therapist, I am no longer afraid of spiders, but as, as long as they, uh, as soon as they go back to hiking when they're in the forest or without their, um, the experimenter is a different context, then the fear sometimes spontaneously comes back. And the, the idea is that there is no, uh, uh, you know, an erasure of, of memories, if you will. Uh, they just learn that in this context is safe, but they don't ever erase the, the, the fear memory in the first place. And that's something that we know from decades of uh, animal learning theories. So it is a problem. Uh, and, and one way we can think about this is, well, here, if you're direct, directly conditioning the, the brain representations, you only have one, you know, set of brain representations for fear. Uh, for, for spider, if you're directly conditioning them, maybe it would generalize better. So that's an hypothesis we are hoping to test. And finally, I think even if we fail, if it doesn't replicate or it just doesn't work for patients, I think that's something conceptually quite interesting here because I think we might be doing uh, double-blinded clinical psychology for the very first time, or at least as one of the very rare occasion where you can do that. If you think about why clinical psychology sometimes is considered by people from uh, um, internal medicine uh, as only a, some sort of alternative medicine, they might, they might not be right, but I think there's an argument to be made that most of clinical psychology, if not all of it, is not double-blind clinical trial tested, right? So in, in, in let's say, vaccines, uh, why the vaccine tests have to be have taken so long is because we have to randomize and control for placebo effects. And we know the placebo effects are, are huge problems. And that's why since the 1970s, all it become the gold standard of all clinical trials to, 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 to have to meet this standard, at least for internal medicine. For surgery, it may be too difficult. Um, but for clinical psychology, you can see that conceptually, it's very difficult to do placebo trials. Because, I mean, how do you train some therapist to give a sham placebo uh, treatments, uh, sham therapies would be very weird to give. And even if you train them to give it, I think that the psychologist giving the therapy would know that they are not actually giving an effective uh, therapy and thereby it would not be fully double blinded. It can maybe single blind, blinded at most. So even if we fail, I think we would, we would fail honorably. We're trying something that is experimentally uh, quite interesting and daring here. So I can talk about this all day, um, but um, I probably won't uh, because I, uh, the, the pandemic put a dent on, on, the, on the progress of this. But let me just end, end this section by telling you one really cool thing I think is really Vincent's uh, uh, ingenious that came up with this. I think the problem about this um, approach, I, I was quite proud of that. And, but but one, one limitation obviously is in a way it is a chicken and egg problem. So the, the, the treatment requires you to decode uh, what is the voxel pattern for, for an animal. And then once you can decode that, you can then do the rest of it entirely non-consciously. So that's very nice. There's no subjective experience of having to see the, see the spider or relive the experience of trauma, et cetera. But how do you get that voxel pattern in the first place? 
as I explained just a slide ago, you basically show them many repetitions of these images. And for these phobic patients, that's exactly the last thing they want to do, to be trapped inside a scanner and to be shown many, many times of these images. And so they might close their eyes so you can't really decode the image. And so Vincent has this really clever method, which is basically to infer the voxel pattern for a target animal without ever showing you that thing. So the idea is um, if you watch uh, apples and oranges and dogs and cats uh, without watching spiders, uh, and I also watch apples and oranges and dogs and cats, et cetera, without, uh, uh, then, then first we can, we can then, having seen the common things, we can rearrange our brain voxels in this common space, which is not trivial because our voxel space depends on the fine brain vasculature uh, in each person's brain. So it's not a common, uh, my, my, the, the voxel patterns, my brain activity patterns for seeing spider is not exactly the same as yours. But if we actually rearrange our, our brain patterns spatially using some clever algorithm so that we are basically in the same space, so that my pattern for seeing apple is very much like your, your pattern for seeing apple, my spider, uh, my, my butterfly pattern will be very much like yours, my dogs and cats and all these other stuff will be very much like yours using this method called hyper alignment. Then from there, I can actually see spider on your behalf. Literally, I become your surrogate. I go and watch a lot of spiders because I'm less afraid of it. Then I can use it to infer what your spider pattern would be like through this common space. And you might think this is a little bit sci-fi and, 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 and not, very, uh, not very practical because even if you can do it, I mean, the, the quality of the signal must be quite poor and you will be right about that. But the good thing about this is once you have one surrogate that gives you a poor signal, nobody stops you from having another one. So someone else can also be your surrogate. And, and that you can, in fact, enlist 100 people to be your surrogate. And with that, with that much data, you can actually average the data and then get at a very good signal. And in fact, we now have a database of about 100 people who have seen these. So it's easy to find 100 surrogate for you. So it actually works. And, and Vincent really pulled off this crazy heroic uh, uh, effort and, and, and is already implemented and we are now using it in our clinical trial. So, okay, so that's basically all the data I'll tell you today. If you're a philosopher, uh, you can now <laughs> relax and, and the rest will just be conceptual. And, but why is it related? So how, how does this study relate to what I talked about earlier? Remember I talked about the Martian problem. If you wanna knock out the, the, the light switch uh, in, in the fridge, you really want something very specific. You want to find the little button where you can just press and turn off the lights, turn off the light or not, right? If you find that, then you would not be end up making these silly conclusion as to what the light does. If you actually know how to turn off the light specifically, then, then you will realize that it has nothing to do with chilling the food. It, it has to do with just, just lighting things up. Uh, but if you don't, if you have a very generic and very blunt tool for, for knocking out the light, such as by unplugging the, the whole fridge, then you would get into all sorts of trouble. And DACNEF, decoded neurofeedback, that is the method I just explained earlier, where you can think of it as multi-voxel neural reinforcement or some sort of uh, non-conscious uh, uh, conditioning or, or voxel patterns. This method is specific in the sense that we are conditioning uh, a representation, so we non-consciously. So when, when those voxel patterns happen, you are not consciously seeing a spider. So we, we have a way of not inducing subjective experience of seeing a spider. And yet the signal is pretty good, right? The signal is selected in the brain online because they are good. So we have a strong perceptual process and it's strong enough to, to, to do conditioning and, and, and learning in such a way that is clinically meaningful and psychologically meaningful. That is extremely rare. In fact, most of the time, most of the methods that we have for knocking out a, a, a subjective percept, usually the signal is pretty much gone. You just don't have much con conscious or non-conscious perceptual processes going on. Um, think about another example that, uh, that is also specific and it's called blindsight. And, and we know that blindsight is special because it's another uh, specific example where subjective experience is gone but people are able still to uh, process the information to the point that if you ask them what is the stimulus, they can guess it at about 80, 90% correct sometimes. So they certainly still have a strong perceptual signal. There is a strong perceptual process going on. What is being knocked out or what is missing is specific. It's just the subjective experience, which is what you want in, in this kind of manipulation, right? Um, just to give you one more example uh, that is also interesting, uh, might be peripheral vision. 
peripheral vision is different. It's not, um, it's not like um, you knock out uh, the subjective percept. In fact, it's quite the other way around. In, in perceptual, uh, in, in peripheral vision, you have a pretty strong sense of seeing details and colors, unless you study a, a lot of psychology. Uh, most people in, in, their, in the middle school biology class, when they learned that the retina has relatively few cone cells in the periphery, uh, most people didn't realize that something doesn't add up. Because subjectively, I don't know about you, but for, I think for most people, we know that they think the periphery is relatively colorful and detailed, subjectively. So you have a subjective impression of seeing things pretty well, but actually it, those kind of phenomen phenomenology can't be really real. Uh, you don't actually have the retinal uh, details uh, in the first place. So some of it must be somewhat made up. Um, so you have a sort of poor peripheral processing, but you have somewhat an inflated sense of subjective experience. Final example, um, aphantasia is another one that is, uh, again, where the subjective experience and the process sort of um, the, the two dissociate. Uh, in aphantasia, uh, people uh, lack subjective uh, imagery. Uh, there's no vivid imagery. And the, the phenomenon took a long time for people to, um, to, to, to appreciate and recognize because people generally don't complain about that because when they lack this subjective vivid imagery, oftentimes they, they are just fine in doing working memory tasks. Uh, they, can, they can do mental rotation, et cetera. So the process capacity, the processing capacity is not gone. It's just a subjective experience that is gone. Now that you might see the pattern of what I'm getting at, I'm saying that these are very rare cases in which the subjective experience really dissociate with just your general ability to process information. And what would be general cases? Uh, I would basically, uh, say that they're everything else we use in the field, um, which is um, such as um, a coma. So when you, when you go to uh, conferences that study consciousness, usually you have a lot of people who study comas. And for coma is in fact, highly related to consciousness. But for a coma patient, of course, it's not just subjective experience that is gone, right? That is our target that we are interested in, in if you wanna build a theory of consciousness. But coma patients also don't walk around. They don't talk to you. They don't remember things. They don't think about things. They don't, they, they don't make actions. They don't respond to stimuli. So basically the general processing capacity in coma patients is largely gone. So this is not a specific manipulation. If you take a coma patient as a selective control for, for uh, uh, knocking out consciousness, you will be like the Martians turning off the fridge by turning off the light of the fridge by unplugging the whole whole fridge. Um, so basically you have a very blunt uh, uh, manipulation there. And of course, coma is, is not something you manipulate and induce, but uh, people also study anesthesia, uh, which they would say is a good model for studying non-conscious processing. Uh, yeah. Yes, in a sense, yes, but if we're building a theory that will be pretty general, again, when people are under anesthesia, of course, is not just the subjective experience that is gone. I mean, generally, people don't, don't think and remember and, 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 and act and respond when, when they're under anesthesia. And likewise, this is now getting into more interesting point. If you think about backward masking, it also isn't uh, very specific. It's not as general as anesthesia. But actually, when you put a backward mass on a stimulus to try to render a stimulus invisible, um, in fact, it's pretty general. I mean, you have some little bit of residual priming effect that it might speed up your uh, subsequent response by five to 10 milliseconds or something like that. But it's nothing like blind sight. The, the contrast is very big, right? In, in blind sight, people lack subjective experience, but they can guess what the stimulus is. Uh, if, if just make them press keys and measure their sensitivity, they, they can be 80%, 90% correct. The D prime that is a signal to noise ratio can, can be bigger than one or two. Whereas for backward masking, when you, when you do it correctly, their D prime is zero. Literally, they have no signal to noise ratio. They cannot guess what's the target uh, by forced choice. There's just a little bit of priming effect. So basically ma backward masking is actually relatively general. It's not as general as coma. I mean, people still can function, but most of the perceptual signal will be gone if you, if you mask it correctly. And likewise with binocular rivalry, under binocular, under intraocular suppression, uh, the, the, the relevant stimulus actually is not just subjectively gone. It's also basically objectively gone. 
there's only a tiny, tiny bit of residual signal in the brain. You generally, you cannot do tasks very well on the suppressed signal. Uh, the measured activity in the brain is also very much reduced. Um, and think about inattentional blindness is the same. Um, um, change blindness, the same. Uh, Motion-induced blindness is the same. So probably you get the idea of what I mean by general. All of these methods that are popular in the literature, commonly used in the literature for studying consciousness, generally it knocks out the whole perceptual process, even not completely, but by a lot. Uh, so you introduce this massive confound there. Now, so I obviously you will see that I'm, I'm advocating that we study more of these specific methods, uh, but that's not enough. The problem is even for my closest allies who study these uh, specific methods, I think very few people are as unwise as I am to want to point out this great chasm between the two. Because essentially I'm saying these specific cases are not just different. They are all there is. Because if you actually do a literature review that combine the specific cases and the general cases, what happens is because the general cases are so much easier to obtain, you will end up having an overall picture that is driven by the general cases. You will overall end up having a theory of consciousness that basically tells you more about how the brain works in general, rather than about subjective experience specifically. That is your theory would be pretty vanilla. It would be about how you know, signals must be pretty global uh, because when you knock out people's consciousness using anesthesia, well, of course, then there's no more global broadcast because presumably that's how, just how the brain works, right? If, if you knock out the, the, just how it works, then, then yeah, then how it works, the mechanisms for which it works. Um, with it, it, it will be gone. So uh, the signal will be less integrated, uh, less sustained, less ignited, uh, less broadcasted, less predictive, uh, less sophisticated. Basically, you would get you you, you would you would think that consciousness is just some sort of fancier, stronger, bigger, better um, uh, signal. And I think this is the. I would say we kind of know that many of us know this is kind of a general problem of theories of consciousness, especially when you talk to people outside of the field. Sometimes they will say, well, what you guys are saying that you're studying consciousness, but if you just delete the word consciousness and say you just study perception, uh, it seems to be fine. It doesn't seem to do anything. So our theories tend not to be very specific. And I think we, we should acknowledge this problem. But I think in the past, decade or so, the problem has really come to a head because I think the field has, um, I think at least some, some people within the field uh, start to perceive the, the progress uh, is, has, has been made. And then we start to say, well, so now we have these theories of consciousness, which I think is really mostly driven by these confounds and, and they are not really very, very useful theories. But I mean, they might be good as working hypotheses. I and mean, I know that we, we have to start somewhere. I don't mean to be so negative, but I, I think if we are too ambitious and try to take these theories at face value and start to apply it to, a, let's say, a, a circuit, a set of logic gates, and then we say, well, now there is some integration of information here and there's some global broadcast. We run some signals through it. Uh, you might even set up some very simple logic gains, have some predictive coding or whatnot. And then you would say, oh, so thereby this thing is conscious. Uh, I think that would not be very convincing to people. In fact, they might think that we are very unscientific. Uh, but I think we are now getting into that space, and, and I think we do attract certain backlash now uh, because of these problems. I think logically it's obvious that this is just based on fallacies. And if we take these not very scientifically correct ideas and be so confident about it and push it so far and to declare in public that, okay, according to signs of consciousness, this logic gate is conscious, I think you should expect a certain level of backlash. Or if you take it to some more uh, controversial domain and say, well, uh, because a fetus uh, has a certain complexity or, or whatnot, it satisfies some criterion by these clearly confounded uh, theories that based on these general notions of how things work. And you say, well, a fetus is also conscious, so uh, abortion should be uh, immoral because it knocks out consciousness. Uh, I think we are really, you can see, I mean, I don't want to say too much, but it, I think we are clearly going in for trouble. This is a very slippery slope. Um, and in fact, some of the uh, authors in the field are now advocating that we um, 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 should choose to be a vegetarian based on our theories of consciousness, et cetera. So 
I don't think that's very good, um, which is to say I'm not a big fan of theories of consciousness in general, including my own. I think the problem has to do with the fact that in the field, we just haven't come, come to terms with this problem that a lot of our manipulations are general. If you really want to see um, what a specific, um, what, a, what a literature review uh, respecting this distinction would be like. So my book, uh, which is coming out in, in uh, February, uh, the first half of it basically is a, is a literature review of the entire literature as I know it or as I care about to, to respect this difference. And if you really think about how to avoid these general cases and focus on the specific cases, the conclusion might surprise you a little bit. All these like global theories or local theories, I would say that both of them are um, kind of incomplete. Um, but I'm not going to go into that today. Uh, instead, I'm going to talk about uh, a theory or something like a theory, because despite the fact that I'm very negative of theories, I feel that the space right now do need some sort of ideas um, to, to, if only to, to provide some alternatives to the existing theories, to have a story that is not so crazy. I think the current theories would push us basically off the deep end. We will end up saying the logic gates are conscious, fetuses are conscious for not very scientific reasons. And I think we would do well to, do something in what, what in genetic people call just those stories, which is somewhat a, a, a not very flattering terms for calling something that is like a pre-theory theory. It's not a real theory that I'm giving you, but I'm trying to give you a story or some intuitions that hopefully would make sense that would fit into what we know about brains and, and machines, uh, evolutions and, and computational modeling. And hopefully that would give you some, some sort of insight what, what a specific theory of consciousness would, would look like and how we can do it. And so I, it's not a real theory, I call it just so story. And also there will be no mathematics. So just not to disappoint, I think uh, having equations is a very important thing uh, if you have, want to have an eventual uh, solid theory, but I think we are very far from being there. So I, my personal uh, approach is to try to not make it so technical. When you make it technical uh, is great because uh, people tend to like that kind of work where people think that it looks sophisticated. Uh, so it's easier for you to, to, to promote your, your ideas. But I think you also narrow your, your peer review uh, space because a lot of people are, are not so technical within the field. So if you push a lot of equations, in fact, it's easy for you to hide behind walls of equations some really poor philosophical ideas. And because it's so complicated, people cannot really review it properly. So you can get away with a lot of uh, uh, bad, having bad ideas. So I rather just lay it bare. So then, you know, I invite philosophers to come and slaughter and, you know, tear it apart. And if it conceptually doesn't make much sense, let's not go further and formalize it. So let's see how it goes. All right. So um, the idea is um, it starts with um, something that is. Uh, basically comes from philosophy. Uh, in fact, it's called a mental quality space. So if you think of um, uh, just an example of color, it applies to all um, sensations and subjective experiences. If you think of color, this is actually a, just a taken a physical color space defined by hue, saturation, and brightness. You can see that it's very interesting because the similar colors are kind of next to each other. Uh, but now, as I told you, it's, it's scaled by physical dimensions. But if you imagine stretching this space a little bit, so the two points next to each other actually precisely reflect how psychologically or how functionally similar two colors are. So you can just stretch a little bit so that it would be exactly two points, the distance between two points would exactly reflect how able you are to discriminate between these two colors. You can call it a mental quality space. And this idea, you can trace it back to uh, uh, Sellers decades ago, uh, um, David Rosenthal, who's actually here, uh, um, um, Austin Clark, uh, there are different people in philosophy who've expressed this idea. It's, it's, it's definitely not original by me. And, and if you think about having this color space, it's actually very nice to have, right? It's conceptually, because if you have this subjective mental quality space, the nice thing is if I just point to one point, uh, you know what that point is like subjectively in the sense that you know how similar it is with respect to all other possible uh, stimuli you can represent on this space. So what, what is blue like? What well, blue is a little bit like purple, is a little bit like, there's nothing like brown, nothing like yellow, uh, very, very much unlike you know, pink and, and stuff. So you know how similar it is to other things. And that's a lot of information that is very rich. 
and that might capture the subjective phenomenology of, of, of color. And in fact, it might capture the subject, subjective phenomenology for any experience. If I ask you what pain is like, well, pain, a sharp pain is a bit like a dull pain, but, but it's more concentrated. Uh, it is not like a tickle, but it's more like a tickle than the sound of a cat. And you can then not explain all these similarity relationships uh, exhaustively. If we can explain every single pairwise comparison between experience in this way, then maybe that's all there is to understanding subjective phenomenology, at least arguments have been made in philosophy to that extent. Now then, but how do you have this space in your head? And that has always been a puzzle to me. Like, okay, having this space as an a abstract theoretical construct seems to be very powerful, but do we actually have this space in our head? And after thinking about it, I think, well, trivial, trivially, yes, we have this space in the head very, in a very trivial sense because neuronal coding in the mammalian brain, at least in the sensory cortices, are known to be sparse and smooth. And by which we mean by sparse, we means that for a single a stimulus is tend to be uh, coded or, or, or tend to depends on just a very small number of neurons. So you have many neurons in the brain, but when you see a color, not the whole brain activates for that, right? Just a subset, of, a very subset of stimulus is enough to code for this color. And in fact, if you want to code for a color in this particular a patch in this region, a very dedicated population would code for this region. So it's very sparse. I mean, the other things don't, I mean, it moves a little bit. There are extra classical uh, receptive effects, but I, I shouldn't brush it off, but mostly it's concerned with a few number of neurons. And it's also smooth in the sense that it forms this continuum of a space, right? So that basically based on the overlap of the neuronal co co uh, coalition, that is responsible for uh, two different colors, based on how much they overlap, you know how similar they are. Two colors are hard to distinguish because they activate very similar neurons. If two different color stimuli activate very different neuronal populations, then they will be easy to, to distinguish. And it just makes mechanistic sense because they, they are difficult to distinguish because the neural codes overlap, right? So this is basically neuroscience undergraduate level stuff. And we know that where, where sparsity comes from. You might think, well, why does the brain works like this? Why is it not like a, a more dense code you can think of? Uh, in fact, uh, some other brain regions outside of the sensory cortex have code that are relatively dense. So the prefrontal cortex, for example, uh, neurons fire all the time for basically every neuron fire to every stimulus to some extent, some of the time. And it's, it's actually all is salt and pepper. This very organized uh, 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 structure is mostly found in the sensory cortices. And it has been computationally analyzed and shown that this is actually a very efficient way of coding. If you want to actually code things efficiently, that actually is a, is a good way to go. And it gives you a very intuitive understanding of the neurons, what we call label lines, which is an analogy. We know that neurons aren't exactly labeled. It's not like this neuron detects clowns in this location, this neuron detects fish. It's not that label, but it's a bit like that, right? So neurons can be given labels such as receptive field. You can say this neuron cares about this region. It is tuned to this orientation. It cares about uh, a color, but it doesn't care about uh, motion. You can, you can actually label things like that. And this point would come back in a bit in a very important way. So these neuron, neurons are addressable. If you want to talk, tell me what an experience is like, well, this experience is like what these five neurons represent. You can actually spatially point to a representation in the head and say, well, this experience maps to these things. Um, and, and then why do you need smoothness? Well, smoothness, uh, again, uh, has been analyzed very uh, carefully uh, in the recent neural network literature, in the machine learning literature. Smoothness is very good for you. It makes things more robust. I mean, you can generalize from different stimuli, right? So if it's um, distinct categorical representations, let's say you just represent color as five different colors, according to Dao De Jing, actually that might be bad for you, right? So one line of Dao De Jing actually mentioned about this idea. If you just categorize things in absolute categories, it actually literally blinds you. Whereas if you represent things in a very smooth and continuous way, you can generalize. If I, if I know that um, um, scarlet uh, is, signals danger uh, and, and crimson uh, signals danger, now that I see another patch of brownish red, I might be able to generalize probably is not very nice. Uh, whereas blue might be a lot better. So it actually helps you to make these generalization and metacognition. 
it actually just make it, these, so these are good things to have. These are not just happen to be something I cherry pick. These are properties of the brain that are uh, independently known to be useful to have. But you say, well, given they are so useful, is it trivial? Is am I what, what I'm talking about? Am I getting into the Martian general general manipulation? I'm just talking about how the brain works in general. Um, yes and no. Uh, I think good brains should work like this, but not all brains work like that. I just told you that the prefrontal cortex coding, for example, is not sparse. It's actually rather dense. Um, the codes are very comb combinatorial. It's not like these code this and these code that. It's all salt and pepper and very complicated. And your computer, of course, is also not like that. Uh, barring the, the monitor and the, and the keyboards are a bit like that, right? They are one, one pixel reflects one thing. But when you go inside a CPU, of course, different information is not spatially segregated like that. Um, and, and also smoothness is also not trivial, not just uh, um, not trivial in digital computers, uh, not common, but also even in, in the animal kingdom, there are creatures that are not smooth. So the, um, um, the mantis shrimp, which is um, one of my favorite uh, food, uh, actually is a very delicious creature, but it's also very interesting in that they have a color sensitivity that is actually poor despite the fact that they have actually over a dozen different color receptors. So they have some, depends on the species, is usually up, up to over a dozen uh, uh, different types of uh, photosensitive receptors, which is more than we have. Um, but still the color sensitivity is, is poor. And the reason is because the different color channels are extreme label lines. They, are, they do not cross talk, there's no opponency. So essentially the, the mantis stream represent a dozen of different colors as a, a dozen different symbols. So what does it mean is, well, they would not be able to do novel mixes. So a color is either detected by these existing channels or they're not. You cannot say, well, this is a new color I haven't seen because it looks almost like brown, but it's a little bit like orange. It's kind of like right in between, I haven't seen it. There's no novel mix of things that they can do. And also uh, they will not be able to tell you uh, one color is more similar to another color because they're just different channels. So, you know, one symbol is to just say, this is not the same as this, but there's no similarity relations they can have uh, uh, between them. So in fact, the, the computer scientist uh, Dasgupta has actually done uh, very formal analyses uh, on this kind of um, discrete versus smooth coding, and found that actually the uh, he anal actually analyzed the, the the smooth coding found also in fruit flies, which I don't think is conscious, which I'll explain why in a bit. But the fruit flies also have smooth coding, um, but turns out the the smooth coding in fruit flies exactly uh, would would fail in these two kind of tasks. And you just take the, um, oh, sorry, if you lack the fruit fly smooth coding, you'll fail in these two, two kind of tasks. But if you take the fruit fly system, it already outperforms some of the best current uh, computer algorithms in terms of doing these kind of tasks. That is novelty detection. So the fruit fly is very good at detecting something is novel. I haven't seen it before. And the fruit fly system allows you to say, well, you, you gave me orange. Let me give you a similar color like uh, red rather than blue. Uh, these kind of tasks, actually computationally, you can also program computers to do them, but actually the current algorithms are not as good uh, as the, the biologically inspired ones. So this is not trivial. It's a very specific algorithms that our brains have evolved to use. And some brains may not use that. Now, I mentioned fruit fry uh, off the cuff very briefly, and I said, I'm not sure they are they're conscious. Um, for some reason, that should be obvious. What I said is about sparsity and smoothness maybe share amongst us with uh, other mammals and maybe even other uh, um, smaller animals like insects. But I think we also have something that is pretty cool, which is predictive coding. Uh, I mentioned about this earlier uh, in, in passing. So predictive coding is the idea that you can take a very high level concept and pass it through what is called generative model that is a top-down model and then generate a specific um, uh, image or, or a specific uh, sensory representation. And in the human brain is interesting, or in the mammalian brain, it looks as if we uh, use this generative model and generate something and project it back to the uh, first order sensory representations that we have. So when we imagine a cat, we actually don't just 
you know, take a concept of cat and then generate a, a neuronal pattern to represent a cat. We actually project that pattern back to the early century areas. And the good thing about this is, of course, then you can, uh, if you, let's say you see something that is like a cat, then you try to imagine a cat, then you can see whether the imagined pattern, the projected pattern in the, in the, in the early century level matches with the observed uh, incoming information. If the, if the mismatch is very high, that means that you have a prediction error. Then you can say, well, let me try something out. Maybe it's a dog. Then you, then you generate a dog image. Okay, then maybe the, the prediction error is small. Then you would say, okay, then it's probably a dog, but not a cat. So you can use this kind of guesswork, combining top down and bottom up to do um, uh, processing. And it's very powerful and we know that and we talk about it a lot. And sometimes people uh, in the neuroscience would come to uh, computer science uh, meetings and say, well, why don't you guys do predictive coding? Because in neuroscience is all the rage. And the computer science people would reply, well, of course we know, but actually most of our models are feed forward only. So some of the most powerful deep learning, machine learning algorithms are feed forward only. It doesn't have any um, capacity to do generative modeling. And the reason is not because they didn't realize that it's good to have, um, but it's the, the problem is that training these models take a lot of data and time. Um, so one idea that has been uh, very useful is this idea called um, um, adversarial, a generative adversarial network. So the idea is you wanna train this generator to take a, um, a, a high level concept to generate uh, uh, an actual um, uh, image or, or representation. And what you do is training this is hard, but it will help a lot if you actually set up a different thing called a discriminator. And the discriminator's job is to basically to, to train, to help train or compete with the generator. So every time the generator generates something um, that is um, uh, um, based on a concept, then the discriminator basically look at the generated output and say, well, does it look like a, a real world data example? Does it look like a real image or a real trigger, externally trigger pattern of activity from the world? Or does it just look like something you made up? So basically the discriminator does forgery detection and try to detect whether the generator can generate something that is close enough to the real thing. And if it doesn't, then it punishes the, the generator. And if the generator managed to fool the discriminator into accepting a generated uh, image as, is, as if it's as good as a good thing, then it, then it punishes the discriminator, it wins a point over them. So by setting them up together to compete, then the two of them actually grows very fast together. And this is what Ian LeCun calls one of the coolest trick in machine learning in the past decade or something. So now it would make sense that for our brains, this discriminator, first of all, is very good to have. If you have it, you can train your generating model to, be, to, to grow faster, to develop faster. And another reason is once you have this discriminator, it can serve the purpose of reality monitoring in a very, sub, in a very specific implicit and subpersonal sense. I don't mean just normal monitoring or whether you're, re, you're in touch with reality. I'm, I'm talking about something very specific. If you imagine a cat, you don't, you don't see it as if a real cat is out there. When, when, when you do confuse that, you are hallucinating, right? You're either dreaming, which is a form of hallucination, or you're really tripping, um, or you have psychosis. Uh, so these are basically some sort of failures of processing that is not necessarily very good for you, uh, especially if you are not sleeping and walking around. And, and so this is what we call perceptual reality monitoring, which is a, a implicit function that happens automatically. You don't have to pay effort to do it. Your brain automatically does it for you. If it doesn't, you are already in big trouble. And you can see that this reality monitoring may well depend on exactly this discriminator function. And in turn, this discriminator function has been hypothesized to, to be in the prefrontal cortex by both myself and Sam Gershman at Harvard. And, and, and there's a bit of physiological evidence supporting it. So if you put electrodes in monkey brains, there are some firing in prefrontal cortex that will look as if it is exactly distinguishing internally generated versus externally triggered representational content. And you can see that this discriminator probably can be used for metacognition too, because this, is, this discriminator basically tracks the statistics of these early sensory activity. So you have to know a lot about what, what early sensory activity looks like to, to know that whether something is self-generated or externally triggered or whether it's just noise. Um, so all of this is very well. So essentially I'm saying that you have a predictive coding that, that we probably know that it, it seems to be how human brains and mammalian brains work. And with that, you have a discriminator that can do implicit metacognition and reality monitoring. And on top of that, 
I would suggest that this re reality monitor is also extremely useful for general intelligence. If you, let's say you are human, you have the ability to um, reason symbolically, that is uh, based on some formal rules about, about things. If you know that if it's raining uh, and I go out, I would get wet. Uh, and if I don't want to get wet, uh, and if carrying umbrella would help me not get wet, then I should carry umbrella. You can think of these desire, believe kind of sentential, um, syllogistic type of reasoning. Um, if you have this kind of symbolic reasoning system, which I think a good, you know, general intelligence system should have, then it would make sense for this discriminator to directly send output to the system because you're constantly faced with the problem of doing this causal reasoning, symbolic reasoning, where you cannot afford to have very high noise. You have to filter out these like vague, uh, unstable perceptual information. And you also definitely need to separate self-generated versus externally triggered information. Otherwise you will be in psychosis. So this symbolic reason system probably constantly take input from this automatic discriminator. And now I know that I'm looking at, like I'm running out of time, but the last wrapping up part would be incredibly fast. Um, the idea is if you have all of this, you can already see that um, this kind of explains why um, when you're conscious of something, uh, when, you, when you consciously, let's say you see a rabbit, it will be very difficult for you to not to believe that there is a rabbit in front of you. Uh, so seeing a rabbit has a very strong logical tendency almost for you to say, well, you, you see a rabbit and therefore you think there's a rabbit. And it's not just a, a belief. In fact, it's a belief that comes with a certain kind of conviction. Uh, it almost justifies your belief. And someone asks, why do you think there's a rabbit? Well, because I'm seeing one. And at the same time, I don't think seeing is believing. I mean, in this context, it's not as simple because sometimes you can see a rabbit and refuse to believe there's a rabbit. For example, if you know that you are dreaming, in lucid dreaming, you can refuse to believe there's actually a rabbit. Or if you uh, happen to ingest hallucinogens for recreational purposes, which you shouldn't, but if you do, then you might see a rabbit and know that it's just hallucination, right? Sometimes you, you, you can know that you're hallucinating. And I think to account for this is not trivial, but, but if you put what I talk about together, essentially when you see a rabbit, of course you have this first order sensory representation of a rabbit, and that, that part is trivial. I think we all agree that that's how it works. Oops, sorry. But the problem is, why do you also feel the logical tendency to think that there's a rabbit? And yet it's not just a belief that there's a rabbit. You almost have a logical basis for you to think that there's a rabbit. Um, in fact, this is what philosophers sometimes call having an esoteric force. So having a conscious experience is gives you this esoteric force. A, a subjective experience presents itself as if it has to be true. And yet you can resist it sometimes. I think that's the part that is difficult to explain. And I think the explanation to me is simple. Is that because you have this representation saying that there's a rabbit and you have this representation, which is the output of your discriminator, essentially pointing at the rabbit and say, well, this representation reflects the state of the world right now. So essentially you almost have two premises leading to the almost irresistible conclusion that there should be a rabbit out there. But I emphasize it's an almost irresistible conclusion because as in a syllogistic argument, when you have two premises, you can jam in some of the premises that would contradict the other premises, then you'll be stuck. If I say that, you know, uh, eating apple is good for you and you want to be healthy, uh, and yet eating apple is expensive and I don't have money, then you kind of stuck, you don't know what to do. Uh, and so this is to say, you, this, this would give you the esoteric force, and yet it is, it is resistible if you have some sort of background belief that contradicts with that, such as another higher order belief telling you this representation right here, that, that this guy to, that says this is here now is very dodgy uh, because I'm, I'm lucid dreaming. This cannot be true. So you can actually resist that, and yet the esoteric force doesn't go away. So this esoteric force, I think, is extremely important because I think it's actually a, a specific thing for consciousness that is not common in other forms of processing. Usually if you reason, if you take information in from, let's say you think that today is Thanksgiving uh, and then someone told you, no, it was last week. Uh, then you just write and you say, okay, then you accumulate information. And if it contradicts, then you just write off what you believe. Your beliefs don't retain this stubborn esoteric force. 
But in conscious experience, such as pain, you can't reason your way out of it. There's no way, you, even if you convince yourself you're not in pain, it still feels painful. I think it's because of this esoteric force. Okay. So essentially, um, this is pretty much all I'm saying. I'm saying if you have these four properties, which we know that are, are very uh, intelligent agents should have, then essentially you have, sorry, my slides are acting funny. You have um, this part gives you the esoteric force. And the esoteric force also almost gives you this qualitative content for free because I started out mentioning about this um, um, mental quality space. And the discriminator, the job of the discriminator is to refer to a, a certain neuronal coalition. So the discriminator said, well, this neuronal coalition, what, whatever it represents, reflects the state of the world right now. But just by having pointing out that address, because of the way neuronal addresses are, by pointing out this is to address, we know how this address is far away from some other representations and is potentially confusable with some other representations. And this is essentially an implementation of the quality space. You see what I mean? So if the discriminator said, well, these neurons in this part of your brain is now representing the state of the world right now, you know what those neurons, the content of that representation is like. You know what, how similar it is to some other things and how dissimilar it is to some other things. And if you know the full similarity structure, you basically know how, what qualitatively it is. If something is a lot like itch, a lot like a doubt pain, uh, nothing like the sound of thunder, uh, a little bit like color red and, and a little bit like uh, something else. You, you basically know what it is like. You, you know what the quality of the representation is like. So that's basically it. So you can have with these four things, you have qualitative content and esoteric force. And my thesis today is that if, when, a qualitative content, when a qualitative content acquires an esoteric force, basically that's all there is to having a subjective experience. And you cannot have a subjective experience without either of them. Uh, just having the quality of content is not going to fly. If it doesn't have that esoteric force, it's nothing like pain. Pain is not just qualitative. Pain feels painful and you cannot reason it away. And that's why it is so phenomenal. And it is not trivial. And I'm going to go back to this point. This is, sounds like a very vanilla just so story, but it has one nice feature. It is not about how you know, processing works in general. It's not like it's just global and integrated and complex and deep. And it, it is actually quite specific in the sense that some other creatures don't have this. They don't have qualitative content, such as the mantis shrimp. And some other creatures uh, don't have esoteric force, um, such as blind side patients. They, 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 they still represent things in the same similar kind of sensory circuitry, but they don't have esoteric force when they, when they guess, when, when they sense what a stimulus is, it doesn't come with this kind of logical tendency to have to believe in what they see. In fact, it's very easy to write it off. In fact, they tend not to believe in that they can guess unless, un, until you convince them. So this is a specific notion of consciousness that accounts for the phenomenology. That may be a good starting point if one wants to build a theory of consciousness. I know that a lot of it is hand-waving. Uh, we have written a more elaborate paper with my colleagues, and hopefully we'll spell out how we can test this idea, which we can discuss in the subsequent section. Thank you.